The Once and Future Nerd Book 1 Princes of Jordan Chapter 9 Darkness on the Edge of Town Episode 1 As you may recall, three Templars of Discord had just entered the inn where Billy, Jen and Nelson were awaiting the return of their friends from the cairn of evil untold. As you may also recall, Billy and Jen had just retreated to a back room to pursue a private conversation before the Templars had arrived. If you will forgive me my brief anachronism, I would like to return our narrative to their conversation just prior to the arrival of the Templars. Billy, hey, listen. I'll put the food back, okay? I only ate like two pieces. I don't care about stealing the food. Ten pieces. I think we've got to run an audible with these college kids. Fifteen, okay? What audible? The one in back? The cranky one? I think you've got to hit on him. Hit him to hurt him or just to scare him a bit? No, no, no. Hit on him, I said. What? Why? Because he's only into guys. I am not doing that. I do it all the time. You can do it once. That's different. How? What do you mean, how? I'm, I'm not gay. Well, I don't want to sleep with any of the snobby douche bros I hit on either. Yeah, but you like the attention. Ugh, like fucking hell I do. Come on. Hey, don't be a jerk. Come on, you like it. Knock it the hell off. Am I right or not? Why can't you do this for me? What's the big deal? What's the big rush all of a sudden? Oh my god, you'd think I was asking you to blow him. You just have to flirt a little. I don't know how to flirt with a guy. Just do what you always do. Maybe it'll work. This feels weird. Do you not understand the stakes here? Yeah, Jenny, I'm not a moron. We need to go home and we need to do it soon. Yeah, totally, just, you know. Billy scuffed his shoes into the dirt floor of the inn, avoiding Jen's eyes. It took a moment for Jen to understand Billy's hesitation. Hang on. You do want to go home, right? Well, I sure as hell don't want to be here. But I don't really want to go back to Pennsylvania. What do you mean? Of course you do. Why? What do you think my future looks like back home? I'll finish high school, barely. Realize I'm not good enough at football when no colleges recruit me get a shitty broke-ass job in a factory, and listen to my dad tell me I'm I'm worthless for doing the same fucking thing he did? I don't believe this. You think I never knew any of that before? Why are you telling me this now? It's easy for you. You've got a shot at a future. You're smart. You can go to college. (laughs) On my single mother's crappy salary? You'll get scholarships and financial aid and shit. No! Back up! Easy for me? What the fuck, Billy? You don't know anything about what I've been through. Then why are you in such a rush to get back? Because if I wait any longer, I won't want to go back either. I I could be powerful here, Billy. Nia's like, actually scared of how good I am with magic already. I can walk anywhere in this world and be the smartest person in the room. Instead of Pennsylvania, where I can't do shit about shit and have to pretend to be stupid for people to like me. Are you talking about me? Sometimes. Look, I know you don't like feeling like I was smarter than... Like I was too smart for my own good. But I wasn't trying to show you up. I just had stuff I thought was worth saying. I think I can get better. No, no. It's not just that, Billy. It's everything. What do you mean, everything? Not just you. Our whole world. I don't know how else to say it. The whole way that I, like, understand myself. If I stay here much longer, I'm just going to be rid of all that. Maybe that's a good thing, but there's no going back. Even if we go back to Pennsylvania, I'll be a different person. Jen took both of Billy's hands in her own, her eyes locked with his. The girl I grew up with, she'll be gone. The girl who fell in love with you, gone. Are you trying to tell me you don't love me anymore? No, Billy... I'll always love you. I just don't know who I'll be or what it will mean for us. 
You'll be Jen. What are you talking about? I mean, there might not be much worth saving between us. No. You need to promise me you're not going anywhere. I can't promise that. I'm sorry. I love you. This is stupid, imagining all this future whatever. You're not going to suddenly change into a different person. I've already started, Billy. Oh, so what? We're, we're just done? Is this it? No, that's not what I'm trying- What are you going to do here without me? Go blow Nelson? Don't be gross. Don't dump me out of the blue. I'm not dumping you. This is the problem, Billy. I'm trying to talk to you about something hard, and you're just attacking me instead of listening. I heard all I needed to. Yeah, you always do. Oh, screw that. No. Bad things. Really bad things that I can't tell you because I'm scared. Wait, like what? Like, just, okay, I've, I've wanted to tell you. Quite suddenly, Jen's balance deserted her. The girl nearly fell, only just managing to grab the nearby doorframe to keep upright. Look, I, I don't feel so good. You need to hurl? No, no, it's not, it's not like that. It's just... just as suddenly, Billy stumbled as well, falling to his knees. I think maybe I've found her. I don't think it's just Zephanol and Dad ale we drank. The door to the inn's common room slammed open, and the sounds of the commotion reached Billy and Jen. Gallatin, save us! Leaning heavily on each other for balance, Jen and Billy stumbled back down the hall towards the noise. They reached the common room to see three Templars of Discord looming in the tavern's entrance, their black cloaks flapping in an unnatural wind. Nelson's unconscious body slumped on the table where Jen had left him. All the patrons of the inn cowered under benches and behind doorways. The Templars glided into the room, a thick black fog accompanying them. Now you shall see the true face of God, and weep. The storm is mine. Bryce Riverfell, the esteemed commander of the keep known as Freehold, was escorting a convoy of supplies through southern Jordan back towards his home. As you'll recall, this convoy had recently obtained a pair of stowaways just outside of Castle Guernacal. These stowaways were now explaining their presence, seated before Bryce himself in one of the covered wagons. Bryce Riverfell sat in silence until Arlene reached the end of her tale. Gods help you. Your own brother. Well, no one I like ever liked this son of a bitch. No offense to your lady mother. We don't take it lightly what we're asking you, General. Are you certain some gold would not make the burden somewhat easier to bear? Bryce shook his head. If I'm doing this, I need to at least be able to convince myself I'm doing it for the right reasons. One of Riverfell's outriders approached the convoy at a dead gallop, his horse frothing from the exertion. Stay as low as you can. Bryce followed the scout to the crest of a nearby hill, pausing only to gather two lieutenants, the large, dark-skinned man by the name of Clarence, and a smaller, bespectacled man known to his companions as the Professor. Together, they peered cautiously over the hill, what they saw troubled them deeply, although should come as no surprise to an astute audience such as yourself. After all, the tale of the three children has not crossed the tale of Arlene and Gwen in ages. They were bound to come together again eventually. What sort of terrible storyteller would I be if they hadn't? Well, fuck me. Dark days indeed. Templars of God's damn discord. To Baileys. How well do you really know that woman? Don't be an arse, Clarence. She's not one of them, if that's what you're implying. I'm just saying I can't think of one good reason they'd come all the way to shit out here. I know her well enough, and she and everyone in her inn are in some serious fucking trouble. You ever fought one before? A Templar? Nope. Professor has, though. We brought bows, right? Yep. Riverfell licked his finger and held it to the wind, judging the distance to the Templars. Wind's with us. Should be in range for Stephen, Gareth, and Niels. Range isn't the problem. Look closely. As the three looked on, the forms of the three Templars flickered and blurred. No Templar appeared to stand in the same place for more than a second. 
They're protecting themselves from just such an ambush, using very powerful magics to mask their positions. You don't know a counterspell or anything like that? Not from here. But their spells require intense concentration. If they were distracted, we might get a decent shot and have time to charge them with lances. Maybe someone down there is smart enough to know that. Or fool enough not to care. Within the inn, Billy and Jen hid from the Templars, although truth be told, they barely clung to consciousness themselves. The lead Templar took the opportunity, as many in his position are wont to do, to deliver a sort of sermon. You know nothing of true power. It is not the solid world. The Yordic is puny and insignificant compared oh, man. to- man, your dick is puny and insignificant. Huh? The Templar's body snapped into focus for just a moment, the obscuring spell broken. What is that even- The Templar fell, an arrow protruding from his back. Two more arrows skimmed the air just past the other two cloaked forms. The remaining Templars quickly slammed the door of the inn. The unnatural smoke had vanished and the Templars stood without a single intimidation spell to protect themselves. They leaned heavily against the stout oaken door. The wooden door of the inn, however, proved to be no match for Clarence, the big man who charged his steed in as if in a jousting tilt. The door frame erupted in a shower of splinters. The lance also managed to squarely skewer the cowering Templars. The sight of a horse standing where the door had just previously been proved too much for Billy's poisoned mind. What the fuck is going on? You fucked up this thing he was doing. Why am I so cold and dizzy? I... I don't know. Are we gonna be okay? I don't know. All of the worst. Two of them collapsed, unconscious on the floor. Clarence dismounted and casually shoved at the remains of the doorframe, opening the way for Bryce Riverfell to stride calmly into the inn, trailed closely by the Professor and a number of his men. There any more of them? I God's damn hope not. Madame Bailey, the proprietor of the establishment, peeked over the edge of the bar. Deeming the threat past, she dusted her apron and walked to greet Bryce. Riverfell himself favoured Madame Bailey, with a very familiar grin. Miss Bailey? Mayn't you a sight for sore eyes, General Riverfell? Can we ever meet when you're not deep in some shit? Do you ever marry the red-haired lass you was always singing about? The two stood in silence for just a moment, appraising each other, before Bryce turned to the destruction surrounding them. Anyone hurt here? Uh, these three here uh, took ill suddenly just before the Templars arrived. Professor, check on them. These three need help. And soon. I think they've been poisoned. Gods. I keep a few of the common antidotes in my pantry. As Bailey rummaged underneath the bar, the professor brought his nose close to Billy's mouth and sniffed deeply. <laughs> this is no cheap alchemist's trick. There's a fern that uh, grows on the border of the southern tundra. Eat a leaf and you die instantly, but the root can be made into a tea which will only cause hours of unconsciousness, high fever, and vivid hallucinations. Wonder who was the first guy dumb enough to eat the root after the leaf killed somebody. The only people known to use it are the Templars. You're saying these three are Templars too? Doubtful. They use the root for their initiation rites, which would be done in seclusion and surrounded by elder Templars. The visions are meant to shatter the mind and thus allow it to be rebuilt as the Templars desire. So, these three probably aren't Templars, but the Templars wanted them to be? It's deeply odd. The Templars don't recruit. They usually want hopefuls to find them. They must think these three are extraordinarily important. Galadon only knows why. Guess that means they're important to us. In any case, they need medical attention. If the fever isn't controlled, they may never wake. You got your potions with you? Well, not the ones I need for this. I, I need to get them back to Freehold. I need to tell you that if I treat them, it will require all of my attention. If the siege you predict arrives before they wake... What else are we gonna do, Rowing? Leave them here to die? You damn sure won't. Not in my inn. No, we won't. 
Get the men ready to leave just as fast as you can, and send for those other two. As Bryce's men carefully lifted the three children to carry them back to the convoy, a pair of young serving boys emerged from underneath the bar. The two boys each ripped off their aprons and threw them at Madame Bailey's feet. Sorry, Miss Bailey. Think we gotta quit? You're joking. If Templars are here, then we won't be. Thanks for everything, but we're not paid enough for that. Oh, fine. Be gone then, you cowardly bastards. Um, gathering your shorthanded around here now. Aye, and who am I going to hire? Oh, I can't pay much, but don't worry. If you're lucky, you'll get killed by a Templar and not have to worry about money. As it happens, I know some folks looking for work. I can vouch for them, but uh, they'll be happy not to ask too many questions of you if you don't ask many of them. How soon can they get here? Very soon. I take it very soon is also when you'll be leaving. As always. There aren't always Templars at my inn. Traff's army is riding on freehold with the Templars out in front. This was news to Bailey, as well as all the patrons of her inn. A shocked murmur rose from the crowd. Oh, Bryce. Point is, if they get past us, this inn is the last of your worries. You see a bunch of people running from the west, follow them as fast as you can and as far as you can, and pray along the way. So, I'll see you again soon then. Bryce Riverfell gave the woman a sad half-smile, and then turned wordlessly to leave. Madame Bailey's gaze followed the retreating general for a long time. As her attention was elsewhere, Madame Bailey failed to notice a small vial, faintly glowing with a golden luminescence roll under a table. This vial, which you will recall was covertly given to Jen by Queen Regan, had fallen out of the girl's handbag as she collapsed. In the commotion, nobody noticed its loss. A cold sun rose over the volcanic plains of southern Jordan. Small flowers dotted the grassy expanse, stems bent under frozen dew. A roar of hoofbeats shook the ground. From behind a hill, a single rider appeared. Her night-black cloak fell over the horse's rump and brushed the ground. As each hoof struck earth, the grass and flowers wilted and died. A dozen riders crested the hill, followed by another dozen and another, countless more, all black cloaked. All at once, the riders raised their arms directly towards the sky and began to chant. Above this eldritch drone, the sky darkened. Tremendous black clouds arose as if from nowhere, plunging the plains into total darkness. Under the cover of this darkness, General Traft marched his army onwards towards Freehold. Bryce Riverfell stood along the tallest ramparts of Freehold. The day was bright all around him, save for the western horizon. There, the unnatural darkness loomed larger by the moment, roiling unerringly towards Riverfell's keep. Far below Bryce's post, the last of the local peasants hurried into the protection of the fort before the large metal gate creaked and slammed shut. Bryce surveyed the darkness for a moment longer before retreating back inside his keep. Within the keep's infirmary, the three children lay in cots while the professor and a host of medics buzzed around them. Bryce looked over the children. You have everything you need, professor? I need twice as many men and no looming siege. You have everything I can give you? You would have heard by now if I didn't. They gonna make it? We'll do all we can. Uh, a lot depends on them. It takes a strong mind to beat this poison. What are the visions like? The consensus is that you face the one thing you're not ready to. What did you see, Roin? You know my love for you, Bryce, but no one needs to know what I saw except me. Sure about that? We'll be fighting for our lives before the next sunrise. All you need to know is that I'm still here. This was, in fact, all Bryce Riverfell needed to hear. His trust in his men unimpeachable, the commander left the healing to the medics and returned to preparing his keep for the upcoming battle. On his own cot, Nelson twitched and convulsed wordlessly. 
In his drug-induced coma, the boy dreamed. Dark fog everywhere. I'm in a car. Backseat of an old Chevy. I know this car. Out the window a sign says Baton Rouge 50 miles. Fall clears just enough for me to see into the front seat. Is that... Oh my god. Mom? Mom? Dad? Dad, is that you? Oh, maybe in the Lacanian sense. What? Well, I'm real in the sense of the nom du père and the nom du père. What does that mean? Oh, stop playing with him, George. Nelson, what your dad is trying to explain in a way I cannot get on board with is that, yes, the biological organisms that made you are gone. But you're more than biology. There are thoughts in your head. Some of them come from us, and in that sense, we'll always be with you. Okay with that synopsis, George? It'll do for now. I still think you're too quick to dismiss psychoanalysis, Sharon. Imperialist bullshit. You're gonna let the Austrians and the French tell you the stories of your mind? Well, institutional issues aside, the notion of the unconscious is too important for decolonization movements to ignore. All the issues are institutional. That's the point. Has to be like this already? <laughs> Hi, Mom. Hi, Pop. So nice to see that you're alive. Hi, Nelson. We missed you, too. Watch it now. We don't like having to get so heavy on you either, but there isn't time for much else. What do you mean, there isn't time? Nelson, you're probably the most educated person in that nowhere town we left you in, and it's like you're trying to forget all the education we gave you. I'm not trying to forget anything. Then what's up with your grades? You could have studied more, Nelson. It's boring. But being bored won't kill you. Being broke will. Trust me on that. I'm not gonna be broke. Oh, oh, you're not, huh? What you gonna do without a college degree? Something, I don't know, I'll figure it out. I won't be broke. This isn't a token book, Nelson. Eagles aren't coming to save you. Oh, don't get me started on talking. Let me ask you something, Nelson. Can tobacco grow in England? I don't know. It can't. So where in the hell in the magical prehistory of England does Gandalf get it from? You think that was fair trade tobacco? You better think again. You're, you're overthinking it. It's magic. Tolkien liked smoking a pipe. He made that Gandalf's thing to represent his affinity for fire magic. Exactly. He made it his thing without considering for a second that it was a natural resource from someone else's land. Can't I just have this one thing? One diversion I can just enjoy without analyzing it to death. One thing? You have so much compared to some people. I don't have my parents. I wanted you to stay home that weekend. I remember I wanted to go to Hershey Park and you'd still be around if you'd just blown off one of the million talks to spend time with. Wait, this is that weekend, isn't it? This this is the car that, but I, I wasn't in the car with you. This is in your head anyway, honey. You are high as a kite right now. Your brain's piecing together things you already know. Can I stop the accident? No, but you know that. One more time, Nelson. This is in your own head. We don't have time for this, Nelson. We were discussing you hiding those stories of yours. What was I supposed to do, huh? Just sit around and, and think about how much I missed you? Books distract me. Don't you get that I needed those books? But you shut off the world, Nelson. There are brothers and sisters out there who need your help. What about me? I needed help. You expect me to be the one black nationalist in, in Lackawanna, get grandma's house burnt down, get the crap kicked out of me every day? No one said anything about nationalism. Borders are the enemy. The master's tools will never dismantle- you stop being so academic for a second and talk to your son? We're not talking? Don't I get to be safe every once in a while? I don't want to start trouble. I. I've had twice enough martyrdom for one lifetime already. You will never be safe until you dismantle the system that makes you frightened to speak the truth. What truth? I'm a 16-year-old orphan. I don't know the truth. That's an excuse because you're scared. Of course I'm scared. I'm scared and I don't know anything. That attitude I will not tolerate. You've been out of my life almost longer than you've been in it. It's been seven years. And... I think he's getting it. The Audre Lord essay you were quoting. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I read that online. 
I, I found it myself. I remember because I, I was reading it the day that I hit level 85 on WoW. I, I was I was reading it on the other monitor while I waited for the raid to start. That internet's something, boy. Malcolm would have been dangerous on Twitter. This tangent is important, but we're short on time. What do you mean? In the Freehold Infirmary, Nelson's body spasmed violently. The professor dabbed cool water on the boy's brow, while medics held the shaking form onto the table. His fever's rising. This car ride will be ending soon. What? No, no, already? That, that's, that's all I get to see you? You're not seeing us. You're just remembering us more clearly than you have. We're in your head. You know that. But the danger coming is very real. You need to get out of this car. But, Pop, No I... time to argue, baby. The, the seatbelt's tightening. I can't... I can't move. What's happening? They won't let you out yet. Who? You haven't figured out what they need you to know yet. Too tight. I, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, Mom. Dad, help. The boy on the infirmary cot began gasping, quick, ragged breaths wrenching from his lips. Get me the fever fuse and the leeches. I can't breathe. Hey, don't panic, son. You're almost there. Think a little harder. I can't breathe. Nelson, you've been learning since we left. You found scholarly writings of your own. Now, are you going to be done with your stories after this? I guess. I, I mean, I... I guess. I don't... No! You're not done with your stories? No, and I won't ever be. Why not? Because stories matter. In the dream, the belt disappeared. In Freehold, the boy took a sudden, deep, clear breath. You're an anthropologist. You know that. Stories matter. You want to understand people, understand their stories. You want to change people, change their stories. People are the stories they tell. Power is who gets to tell the stories. <laughs> That's good, son. We told you, you knew more than you were letting on. You need to get out of the car now, Nelson. Can I at least... No, tuck and roll. We love you, baby. And we're always with you. I, I, right, I, I, Nelson I, I, Malcolm Conti, go! In his vision, Nelson leapt from the speeding vehicle. As he sprawled into a nearby ditch, he saw another such vehicle speeding towards his parents. The sound of the impact was deafening. In the manner of dreams, Nelson's parents' vehicle was utterly destroyed in a cloud of metal and glass shards, while the other vehicle remained intact. A man, obviously inebriated, climbed out from the second vehicle. He inspected the wreckage, vomited, and then returned to his own car and sped away. Hey! Hey, get the hell back here! Get the hell back here, you redneck son of a bitch! <laughs> Nelson's anguish was interrupted by the arrival of a young girl. She was the very picture of innocence, save for the gaping puncture wound in her chest. Around Nelson and the girl, the world went still. The smoke from the wreckage stood still, and the rain of shattered glass froze in mid-air. Who are you? What's happening? There are seven things you must know to save me. The sixth thing is, order is a story made flesh through power. Huh? I am with you, Nelson. In a cot in the Freehold Infirmary, Nelson's eyes shot open. Cold! Where am I? Why am I so cold? Your fever's breaking, and this is Freehold. What about Billy and Jen? That's what they're called. You're the first to wake, young... I'm Nelson. Nelson Malcolm County, who are you? My name's Roin. You a knight? <laughs> Was almost a doctor, but it's just Roin now. Professor! On the adjacent cot, Billy's entire body began seizing up, his arms and legs flailing wildly. This one's having a fit. A group of medics rushed to restrain his limbs and keep him on the bed. Is he going to be okay? I don't know. Oh, bright. Where am I? Is that my dad's piece of shit old firebird? Heads up! Huh? <clears throat> Dad? What do you think? Every throw's gonna come right to your hands? You gotta hustle for those, Junior. Yeah, I know. I, I just couldn't see. No excuses. And watch your tone. All right, now throw it back. How's the leg today? It's fine. Now throw it back. Okay. That was a pansy throw. 
You know how quick weak shit like that'll get picked off in the Big Ten? Ugh. Now throw it like a man. Hut! <clears throat> oh. Oh, you think you're fucking funny? You like to goof off? No, Dad, I, I was just... Maybe if you quit goofing off, you'd be something. Maybe you guys would've won a fucking game this season. I haven't been goofing off. Shut up. Why do you think the scouts aren't at your games? Because there's no scouts in Nepa. Nobody cares. Like hell they don't. They were there when I was playing. Then why do you never get recruited? What the hell did you just say to me? I know I didn't raise you to be a disrespectful, ungrateful little shit. And I know you don't want your ass beat. Why don't you back off, Dad? Make me. Go ahead, hard ass. Take a swing. Two chicken shit? Come on, pussy. Show me what a man you are. Hey, Bill? Yeah? yeah? Can you come in here and help me with this? With what? With this stove. I've been asking for your help all week. I'll do it later. I'm with my boy. It is later. I'm with my boy, damn it! Now throw me the ball, Junior, and no fucking around this time. What? I told you I'd do it later. I don't need your help. Just putting the laundry out. You need to do that right now? Gotta get done. Well, do it during the week when you're just watching TV instead of the one day I get to spend with my boy. Dad, it's still early weekend. You keep quiet. Oh, screw you, Bill. Screw me? I told you don't ever disrespect me in front of my son. I'll respect you when you act respectable. You don't even know what respectable means. Look at you. You're a goddamn mess. Respectable means worthy of respect, which is something you'll never be. I'd be respectable if I hadn't married a good-for-nothing loser! I swear to God, Mary, if you don't crawl out from my ass for ten goddamn minutes... Why don't you spend ten goddamn minutes teaching your son something useful? <sighs> you fucking... Come on, Junior. <laughs> hey, I said let's go. I'm gonna watch the game with Frankie and them. What are you, deaf? I'm staying here. You don't need to be around your ma when she gets like this. Fuck you, Bill! <laughs> yeah, I do. This time, I do. Junior, get in the car. No. Get in the fucking car! Mom needs help! You're just gonna drop everything for her every time she goes into her fucking hysterics? I'm staying here, Dad. Junior, I'm gonna give you this choice exactly once. She needs help. Ow! D Dad, what, what are you doing? Get off me! Don't be a pussy! In the Freehold Infirmary, Billy's entire body began seizing up, his arms and legs flailing wildly. A group of medics rushed to restrain his limbs and keep him on the bed. This one's having a fit. Is he gonna be okay? I don't know. I'm bleeding, you ungrateful little shit! <laughs> Dad, what's happening to you? I gave up so much for you. I could have kept playing ball. Instead, I stayed around to bring you up. And this is how you repay me? Now I'm a workaday loser with a loser fucking son who can't even be bothered to watch a ball game with his dad. You didn't raise me. What? You taught me to throw a ball and treat people like shit. That's not raising me. I tried to teach you how to be a man. Sounds like I failed! That's not the kind of man I want to be. You sound like a goddamn tree-hugging faggot! This is your fault for calling the boy Mary, you stupid bitch! Dad, stop! Leave my alone! I'm gonna crush the weakness out of you! Dad, don't step on me! Say it! Say it! This hurts! You're gonna kill me! Please stop! I raised you! You'd be nothing without me! And now I'm half a person! I'm broken and you are too! It's you and your ma who broke me! No, Dad! You gotta learn how to be this mean! I don't know who taught you, but you taught me! <laughs> Jen's hurting! I love her so much and she's hurting all the time! Everyone I love is hurting! and I don't know what to do. Sometimes I'm funny and they feel better, but most of the time I just get angry at people for hurting because I don't know what else to do. You're weak. 
You're weak! I'm done! I'm done not being human! I want to feel feelings! I'm tired of hurting everyone because I'm scared! Ah! Oh! Suddenly, the monster that Billy's father had become was gone. In his place stood a young boy who looked very much like Billy's father from his own childhood portraits. I'm so sorry, Billy. I'm so sorry, Mary. It's not just easy like that, Dad. You hurt us a lot. Billy, this is all in your head. He's explaining so that you can know. Not so you can forgive him. I'm not going to live my life just hurting everyone who cares about me. It's not like that's what I wanted to do. I want to be the kind of strong that can help people, not tear them down. If you need to tear people down to feel strong, then you're not strong. Caring about people's hard and scary. That's what takes real strength. I could be damned. That thing hasn't run since 79. I think it's for you, Billy. Dude, bitchin'! Uh, I need to work on my vocabulary too, don't I? Yeah, Billy. It's okay. One thing at a time. Cool, Ma. Love you. Pace. In the Freehold Infirmary, Billy suddenly awoke from his coma. He leapt off his cot, much to the surprise of the professor who had been tending to the recently unconscious boy. Hey man, I'm Billy. Thank you for your help. Sorry if I puked or anything, honey. That was a pretty gnarly trip. Nelson, how's it hanging? Pleasant trees aside, Billy went straight for Jen's cot. Jenny, I love you. I'm sorry. Come back to me, okay? Billy grasped Jen's hand in his own. The girl twitched lightly but remained unconscious, submerged in her own hallucination. Wait. Oh, no, no, no. Anywhere but here. Not, not the locker room. I'm in Jordan. I'm not here. What? I mean... This can't be. No. No, 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 no. C come on! Please let me out. Ugh! Come on. Ugh! Just open! Why won't you open? Ugh! Hey, girly. Regan? What are you doing here? What's the matter, badass? This is the locker room. Coach McCreary. So gut the son of a bitch. Here's your knife. Same one you did McShane with. I can't do this. I'm not ready to see him again. You're okay. You're stronger than you look, remember? This is a dream. It's... It's not real. I just gotta wake up. Wake up, Jenny. Wake up! Sorry, girly, not that kind of dream. Open your eyes, look at me. Hey, look at me. Now stand up. You remember what I showed you? Knife fighter stance. Keep moving. Keep your knees and hips all loose-like. And that trick you did with freeze on would probably be a good idea. You've got this. Don't leave. You know as well as I do, this is your fight. Wait, wait. Hang on, don't... Oh, fuck. Okay, McCreary. If this has to happen now, then get your scumbag ass out here and let's do this. Wait. You're not McCreary. Antonin Mooncrest, the one-time fiancé of the now-missing Arlene Redmore, was taking a late supper in his tent on the fields outside Castle Guernatal when he heard one of his pages call to him. Lord Antonin. Enter. Two boys in Mooncrest's colours entered the tent. What news? Lord Redmore has chosen the terms of your duel, my lord. You shall fight with daggers, my lord. Daggers? Only a brave man fights with daggers. I take this to mean Redmore has appointed a champion to fight in his stead. That is true, my lord. 
As I figured. Who will be Redmore's champion? <clears throat> that has not been publicly announced yet, my lord. Of course not. And when is combat to commence? Now, my lord. Antonin Mooncrest understood after a short moment, but that was one moment too many. The first page drew a dagger and jabbed it under Antonin's ribs. <clears throat> the second page thrust his blade towards Antonin's throat. With no time to draw his own knife, Mooncrest lifted his left hand into the path of the blade. The dagger plunged into the flesh of Antonin's <clears throat> hand, but at least his throat was intact. With his right hand, Antonin threw a blow at the first page's face, instantly breaking the boy's nose. He searched for a weapon and found his teapot boiling on some coals. He grabbed the pot and smashed it over the head of the page. With the boys stunned and reeling, Antonin Mooncrest took the opportunity to draw his own dagger. He just managed to dispatch his two assailants before collapsing to the ground. At the horse's head inn, Madame Bailey's fine establishment on the southern plains, Arlene and Gwen were working their first shift. In the interest of secrecy, they were operating under the pseudonyms of Anna and Gail, respectively. Gwen, that is, Gail, had been serving food all her life and took to her new job instantaneously. All right, then, four aisles, mutton, mutton, pheasant, mince pie, and rice for the table. I could describe to you the food served by Madame Bailey's chefs, but quite frankly, that would be terribly boring. Honestly, I'm sure you've all eaten before. You understand the concept. There's absolutely no need to describe every dish being served. As Gwen distributed the food, a patron slid a handful of coins her way. These she crisply pocketed. Thank you, my good man. As Gwen turned to leave, a glowing from underneath the table caught her eye. Just as quick, she covertly slid her coins back out from her pocket and dropped them onto the floor below the table. Oh, curse my hands. Pardon me. In an instant, the coins and the small vial of glowing golden liquid were back in Gwen's pocket. As she stood up, she heard a commotion coming from the other side of the tavern. Oh dear, are you all right? Gwen rushed across the room to where Arlene was standing, helpless and confused, next to a portly pub patron whose face had gone beet red and was clutching at his own throat. What's happened? I told her no pepper! <coughs> you all heard me say to her no pepper! Oh, a little spice won't kill you. It gives me halves, you imbecile. Whatever is the matter, Mr. Rawls? Your moron of a wench brought me food with pepper. Boy, what gives you the bloody right Quiet, to... Gail. Terribly sorry, Mr. Rawls. Your supper's on the house tonight, of course, as are your drinks. <clears throat> Service hasn't been this bad in years. Gentlemen, we'll have your food to you just as soon as we can, and we'll fill your cups even sooner. Anna, Gail, won't you help me in the kitchen? Now. Anna, what in Goradian's gaping arsehole are you doing out there? I'm sorry, Miss Bailey, there were just so many orders, and... She's trying so hard, Miss Bailey. I don't doubt it, but Mr. Rawls is my most loyal customer, and now he's covered in hives. How am I supposed to keep you on after that? What? No, please. I like a dairy, and I was happy to do Bryce a favour, but at the end of the day, we're talking about my livelihood. She just needs more time. It's all right, Gail. No, it isn't. Can't you have an art, Miss Bailey? Don't you dare presume to know me heart, lass. Think I'm all golds and silvers, do you? Well, I got kin I'm thinking about. I got one sister, makes the finest lady's armour in Armstrong Guard. Can't move a piece of it lately, cause suddenly everyone's up in arms if lady's armour shows a little leg. Why, why would armour need to show any leg? I got another sister, thrown out of house and home cause some mad little tart killed a sergeant of the guard right on her bloody doorstep. Everywhere I look, me kith and blood are falling on hard times, and they're all counting on me to keep things together. Do you expect me to do any less for me sisters than you're doing for each other? No, of course not, but- Then I need to stay in business. The two women hung their heads, defeated, until Gwen came upon an idea. Anna can sing, Miss Bailey. Gail, please be serious. You can. 
She has the most beautiful voice I've ever heard. I bet it's been a while since you had music in here. And is your singing supposed to cure Mr. Rawls of his hives? I can see you gals are young, not too wise in the ways of the world. We are plenty wise, don't you worry. I don't think so. If you were, you'd be asking yourself, how is it an old maid stays safe out here all by herself? I can't afford any armed men and I surely can't count on Bryce to be here. I stay safe because everyone who comes through likes being here and they like me. Someone has a few too many and acts a fool. Someone else will sort him out for me. But if the crowd ever sours on me, things could get very ugly. And I'm too old for any of that. This tale had the appropriate effect on Arlene and Gwen, as neither of them could meet Madame Bailey's eyes. Arlene began to silently cry, tears streaming down her cheeks. Ah, gods curse me, soft heart. I'll give you one more chance, and I'm mad for doing that. But one more incident like tonight and you're done. And I'll tear you down in front of everyone out there to save face. Because I'll have to. Understand? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Miss Bailey. You won't regret it. Yes, I will. Now bring Mr. Rawls and his friends their drinks. Yes, yes Miss Bailey. Bailey. Back outside Castle Gwernathal, Julius Mooncrest, uncle to Antonin, had been sitting in council with his lieutenants. Antonin himself was hours late, extremely unusual for the man. Concerned, Julius and his men had then sought out Antonin's tent. They drew back the flap and discovered the gruesome remains of the earlier combat. The bodies of the two pages remained where they fell on the floor. However, each one's pockets were turned out and their blood-stained coin purses spilled in front of the former owners. Julius bent down to inspect a coin and found the cruel visage of Ardell Redmore staring up at him from the silver. Enraged, he hurled the coin at the far wall of the tent. It was then that he noticed the smear of blood leading from the desk to the back of the tent and out underneath the far wall. Back at Bailey's Inn, the atmosphere was once again jovial as it often is when alcohol is served to mortals. The room was full of conversation. So then she says, what do you think I am? The fucking queen? <laughs> wait, wait, have you heard about this orc, this priestess and this big fan? The tavern patron, gesturing wildly to demonstrate this joke, knocked an entire tray of food and drink out of Arlene's hands. Oh, g goodness, I'm so terribly sorry. Hey, why don't you watch where you're going? Yes, of course, I will. Oh, God. Gwen rushed from across the room to intervene. Gail, I don't know what happened, I was just... It's all right, I'll clean this up. You go and... Oi, I've been waiting on me sweets for near to half an hour. They'll be right out, Mr. Rawls. Anna, could you please go to the kitchen and fetch... Wait a bloody, ruddy minute. It's my food what was dropped on the floor. I should get mine first. I ordered mine first. We'll serve you both very soon. This patron's issue, however, was less with the quality of service and more with the aforementioned Mr. Rawls. The two were up from their seats and shouting at each other's faces in a flash. Listen, you rich bastard. I've been coming here as long as you have. <laughs> Except I order more than grog and rice. You common whore's whelp. Gentlemen, let's all cool our tongues. Common? And what are you? He thinks just because he owns a lumber mill, he's a lord or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Your blood's well. as common as mine, you up-jumped cockpox. I'll show you common blood. In the blink of an eye, Bailey's common room went from jovial dining to an all-out tavern ball. Fists were flying, flagons of ale were smashed over skulls, and chaos generally raged. In a clever tactic, someone tossed a bowl of pepper at Mr. Rawls's face. <laughs> I'll eat your spleen, you scum! Oh, Galadin's good grace. Anna, God damn it! I should have had more sense than to trust your worthless hide. Arlene's oh, eyes were closed her, tight say, as she began to sing. There were two sisters by the sea, maidens fair as fair can be. The younger's voice was the pure 
first but none, the elders bright as candle in the sun. Had anyone been paying attention, they would have seen the world shift and shimmer, almost imperceptibly. As her song gained in strength, some heads began to turn. To town one day there rode a knight, singing here's where I'll find one. The elder said this much I know, if he hears her sing I'll be yet alone. An eerie stillness coated the room. So she called out, sister, come with me. Let's go walking by the sea, and the waves did thrash, and the wind did churn, and only the elder did return, returned alone, returned alone, la 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 do do. The room was filled with applause. The cause of the brawl, all but forgotten. Of course, Mr. Rawls's face was still swelling like an overripe melon from the pepper. It would take much more than a song to cure that. One day a dragon came Even so, his anger was no longer quite as sharp as it had been. The night went to the dragon sleigh, and so this sister widow made. Gwen looked on with pride, and not a little surprise. Knowing that her doom was near, she thought of the sister once held dear. So she crawled to the mound where the dead did rest, and cried upon her family crest. A wicked, rotten wretch am I, woe that I have but once to die. Was not just you I drowned that day, the best part of me too washed away, washed away, it washed away, ba la 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 day day. Daddy? I could have sworn it was going to be McCreary. What are you doing here? In some ways, I've always been here. No, you haven't. You left. See, you know that whatever poison you drank had a bunch of... molecules that bonded to your spinal cord and crawled up your brain and connected all the wrong synapses. So now your brain's combining things you already know just in new ways. Like your dad knowing words like synapse, <laughs> you were so much better in school than I ever was. In other words, I can't tell you anything that part of you doesn't already know, which means everything you see of me is part of you. So in that way, I never left. Yeah, but in the way where I'm supposed to grow up with a dad, and where mom's supposed to raise me with a husband, you did leave. Are you gonna try to tell me that deep down I was okay without you? Because I wasn't. No, I'm here to talk to you about the decision you've got to make. Why are you the person I need to talk to about that? You'll figure that out. And why are we here? You'll figure that out. Is that going to be your answer to everything? Am I on my own? Again? I really want to help you, honey. But first things first, you need to ask the right questions. Can we at least go somewhere else? Not yet. I'm sorry. Come on. I would if I could. It's out of my hands. That's convenient. You got every reason to hate me, honey. But we can't leave until you ask the right questions. Fine. What's this big decision I've got to make? You said it yourself to that boy you're seeing. Stay in your new world, see everything you can be, and lose who you were. Go back to your old one, stay safe, always know you could have been more. Hmm. Which one's the opposite of what you would have done? Your ma never told you why we split, did she? She said things weren't working out between you and you decided you had to leave. And you were smart enough to know there was more to it than that. I mean, sure, but 
you still decided that whatever you had to figure out was more important than your wife and daughter. But part of you remembers that car accident, right? The doctors told me I was scared, so I blocked it out. Yeah, you didn't, though. You heard people whispering after. You remember the smell in the truck? Beer. Uh huh. But I mean, it was probably left over from before. You weren't drinking at two in the afternoon before you had to pick me up. Think about it. You know I was. Jesus Christ, are you trying to make me hate you more? Why would you tell me that? Like I said, I'm trying to make you ready to decide what you want from your life. Why should I take advice from you? Wrong question. This is my coming of age hallucination or whatever. I should get to pick the questions. And I think that's a damn good question. It is, but it's not the question that'll help you now. Be more direct. What are you really trying to ask? What the hell is wrong with you? Getting tanked before you get in a car with your daughter? Well, your mom was supposed to pick you up that day, so I thought I had the afternoon to myself. And she called me from the hospital and said she just found out she had to work a double. I didn't want her to know I'd been drinking. Thought I was okay to drive. If that's true, then why didn't the police ever come around? You don't think your ma had friends at the hospital? Anyway, I think your ma always knew my drinking was a problem, but that wreck was when she realized I was a danger to you. So, she told me I had to leave. Why didn't you just stop drinking instead of leaving? Why don't you stop is always the wrong question to ask a drunk. Okay. Why'd you start? There you go. You know how Lackawanna is. And I'm sure as hell not a very smart man, but I think I was just a little too smart for that place. Not smart enough to get out, though. Why not? I could have maybe gotten to college, worked three jobs to put myself through, but when you're 18, marrying your sweetheart seems a lot more pleasant than all that. Your mom's the only thing I ever loved about that crap sack town. <laughs> Thought if I just had her, I could put up with the rest. Did mommy know you felt that way? I told her often enough, but by the time I realized I couldn't put up with the rest, your ma had already got with you. So this is my fault? Oh, sweetheart, none of this, none of this is your fault. So when I started feeling like I was too smart for my own good, I thought I'd make myself just a little dumber, and then I could be there like my family needed me to be. Oh God, is that why I get drunk too? So I can let myself be stupid for a while? It's nice, isn't it? You know, started out just Friday nights, cause screw it, work was over. And Saturdays, cause that's what everyone did. And I started having a few more, watching the game on Sunday, then Wednesday to get me over the hump, then you understand. So you're saying if I stay in Nepa, I'll be an alcoholic? I don't know the future. I know the past, and I know you. Can't one goddamn thing in my life be easy? Yeah, some things can. You could have any fella in Pennsylvania wrapped around your little finger. Thank Christ you got your ma's legs and not mine. <laughs> Keep that up until you get old and he gets bored. Or until you get bored and run off with some junkie painter from the city or something just to prove to yourself you can still feel something. Jesus, dark much? Hey, this is all coming from your own head, remember? It's not even really a choice, is it? You can try pretending you're someone you're not. But not forever. Do I have some time to think about it? Some. Not as much as you'd probably like. We've got a few more minutes, though. You want me to buy you some ice cream? Wait. Really? Outside Freehold, the unnatural darkness had reached the walls of the keep. In the darkness, a squad of orcs, dressed in black, with skin darkened by war paint, scaled the thick outer wall. Hidden by the Templar's artificial night, they were entirely undetected, until it was too late. They reached the top of the wall, and without a sound, slew the nearby guards. Inside the keep, 
Jen still dreamed. This isn't the locker room anymore. This looks like a... Is this Atlantic City? Honey, I can't give you piggyback rides anymore. I'm too grown up. Yeah, it's kind of weird now. Yeah, I'm gonna put you down. I remember you taking me and Mom here for the summer. Yeah, I thought I'd be nice to go out on a pleasant memory. Why'd we have to start in the locker room? Probably because you blame me somewhat for all that. Not as much as I blame myself. No, that's crazy talk. I should have fought back or put a stop to it sooner. For Christ's sakes, you were a child without anyone to turn to, really. And that last part is my fault. But the fault for what that son of a bitch did to you is his alone. He picked you out because you didn't have anyone. Because that's what predators do. You weren't the first or last for him. That almost makes me feel worse. But that's the truth, and you should know it. Storm's coming in. Do we need to leave? You do. Time for maybe one more question. And before you ask me anything about love or faith, remember, I'm just an unlocked version of your mind. Ask something it's worth hearing from yourself. The morning you left, I pretended I was sleeping when you kissed me goodbye. If I knew I'd never see you again, I would have gotten up, but... You left a tape on my dresser? I know it was the one you used to play for me in the car, but I... I can't remember what that was. Why didn't you listen to it? Couldn't bring myself to. I put it on CD, though, and then on my phone. It was Springsteen. Darkness on the edge of town. I thought maybe it would explain things better than I could. Oh, yeah. You like the last song best. There's whatever little world you grow up in, and then there's the darkness all around. Outside normal, outside supposed to. The point of that song is there's some people who just need to take that step into the darkness. It's scary! That's how you know you need to go there. I love you, sweetheart. I'll always love you. I know. Woo! Jen's face was drenched with water as she sputtered to consciousness in the freehold infirmary. A medic stood above her, holding a now empty water bucket. We've been infiltrated! Find something to fight with or somewhere to hide! Battle raged in the hallways of freehold. Small pockets of Riverfell's forces held out against the nimble orc scouts. But the orcs, whose fighting skills were honed in the mines of the Black Mountains, were far better in the dark and close quarters. In a particularly narrow hall, Billy and Nelson had each found swords and were fighting back to back with a handful of guards. To their credit, the children's experiences in the Orden had drastically improved their swordsmanship. They were still giving ground, however. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning arced through the air of the hallway and struck down an orc as he was about to swing his axe at Nelson's head. A second bolt of lightning and another orc fell. Jen lowered her outstretched hand and ran to join her friends. Reinforced by and heartened by Jen's magic, the men turned the tide of the battle and in short order that precious yard of hallway was secured from the invaders. The guardsmen cheered. You man the wall, you sorry sods. As the men rushed to their posts, Jen and Billy took a moment to revel in their reunion. I love you. I love you too. I'm glad you're okay, Jen. Thanks, Nelson. Billy. I think I need to see this out. See what I can be. I know. Before charging into the battle, Jen retrieved her iPhone from her handbag. She plugged one end of a wire into the device. The other end she wrapped around her finger. Jen closed her eyes, and the world twisted and shimmered. A glow flowed from her fingertip into the wire and into the device. The device's screen came to life. Jen navigated the device to Dad's tape and selected track 10. As if conjured from the air, the voice of a bard known in Jen's realm as The Boss came
came from the device and filled the hallway. As this man sang about venturing out into the darkness on the edge of town, Billy and Jen ran to rejoin the battle. While battle raged in Freehold, several miles to the east, Arlene and Gwen had retired to their rented room in Bailey's Inn, exhausted from the evening's work. That was... wondrous. All I did was sing. No. I don't know what you did, but it wasn't just singing. They was... hanging on your every word. Between the two women sat a pile of coins, most of them earned by Arlene's voice. What do we do now? We can do what we want. Very well. When first I laid eyes on you, it hurt me how beautiful you were. You've only become more beautiful since then. And tonight, you look so beautiful, I fear it shall drive me mad. What I want is to kiss you. Would you let me? Slowly, tentatively, Gwen lowered her head to Arlene's, and their lips touched. I love you, Gwen. Every song I'll ever sing will be for you. Gwen moved her face close to Arlene's yet again. But as their lips touched, Arlene pulled their whole bodies close together. <sighs> you know I love you too. Do you find me beautiful? So beautiful. Did it ever hurt you, that feeling? Every day. Did you ever find relief? Sometimes. Battlements of Freehold, the three children from northeast Pennsylvania stood alone in the conjured darkness. Before them stood Traft's hordes, a mass that stretched to the horizon. What do we do about that shit, Nelson? Anybody got a game-breaking super weapon they haven't told us about? Jen lifted her hands in front of her face. Sparks flew between her outstretched fingertips. I'll see what I can do. For additional information and bonus content, access onceandfuturenerd.com on your computer machine. New episodes are released every other Sunday. The Once and Future Nerd is written and created by Zach Glass and Christian Madeira and directed by Christian Madeira. It is performed by Rhiannon Angel, Garrett Arman, Dan Dobransky, Lily Draxler, Anya Gibeon, Ian Harkins, All Notice, Frank Queres, Julie Reed, Gregory M. Schultz. Special guest appearances by Kimberlyn Avon, Brandon Durden. It is co-executive produced by Jess Kelly. Alex Story is an associate producer. The Once and Future Nerd is recorded by Brian Forbes at the Gallery Recording Studio in Brooklyn, New York, with additional audio engineering by Sam Palumbo. Foley sound design and mixing is done by Sandra Ramirez. It is edited by Josh Perot and Christian Madeira. Theme music is composed by Tom Lee. Additional music by Christopher Montalbo. Thanks for downloading.